Wow, it's so nice to see such a full room this morning. So, well, good morning. On behalf of the Seidman College of Business Alumni Association, I want to welcome you to our first Peter F. Secchia breakfast of the 2019-2020 year. And it goes without saying um, that we are extremely grateful um, to Peter and Joan Secchia for their continued generosity to make these breakfasts possible. So thank you very much, Peter and Joan. Well, I'm really excited to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Jill Dooley. I am the Director of Philanthropy for the Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, and we are a national nonprofit headquartered right here in Grand Rapids. Um, you, may not, you may not know, or for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Phoenix Society is the leading nonprofit organization. We are dedicated to empowering um, anyone who is affected by a burn injury. Um, and our focus really is uniting the voice of burn survivors um, in the burn community around the globe um, to um, really focus on advocation and advocating for and advancing lifelong healing, optimal recovery, and burn prevention in this space. I am also a very proud Seedman College of Business graduate, um, and I am currently serving, thank you, for everyone in the room. And I'm also on the Seedman College of Business Alumni Association board. I'm really proud to do that and serve this university like that. I want to welcome our students this morning. Uh, we understand that uh, your concentration and focus is probably on your classes um, and getting back into the study mode. So we really appreciate you taking some time this morning to network with folks in this room and just spend time with us. So thank you for, for joining us this morning. This is a really exciting time for Grand Valley. Um, our university has grown to who we are today through decades of really strong leadership. And I believe we can be just as confident in our future as we enter a new chapter of leadership for Grand Valley. Um, I hope you are as, as optimistic and excited as I am. So this morning, I am happy to introduce Rabia Jamal, who is going to introduce our president this morning. Rabia is the chief operating officer for Wasayabek Development Company, which is a Native American investment vehicle here in Grand Rapids. Rabia is an active and very dedicated Seedman College of Business alum who served in a past role on the Seedman College of Business Alumni Association and is now serving on the Seedman Advisory, Dean's Advisory Board. He received an MBA from Grand Valley in 2011 and has a BS in Engineering from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Rabia Jamal. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I was joking with Jill earlier that um, I work for a tribe called the Nottawasepi here on Band of the Potawatomi. And our investment vehicle is called Wasayabek, and my name is Rabia. <laughs> and, and I was joking with her that there should be a prize if she could say all three of those things together correctly. Um, so, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, there was kind of a little bit of a storm last night. and. Uh, we still had a full house, so I think that says a lot about the, uh, uh, the, the speaker that we have today. So it is my honor to introduce our speaker. Uh, president Mantella comes to us as uh, the fifth president of, the, uh, of Grand Valley State University. And I think more importantly, our first female president, which is uh, something that I think is something to be very proud of as an alum, that Grand Valley is putting a mark in its history having its first female president here. So. We're very, um, we're very proud of that. President Mantella received her PhD from Michigan State University and led Northeastern University for almost 20 years. Uh, among her objectives, I found, was uh, she wants to focus on uh, learner outcomes. She wants to make Grand Valley distinct and visible in, with its populace. And she wants to activate the full community, which are all things that, as an alum, are very important to us. Her background, and experience, her background and experience in innovation and growth is, uh, in higher ed is exciting. And as alum, as alum for Grand Valley, I am uh, hopeful that she will lead Grand Valley in a manner that is consistent 
with this history, but one that also uh, makes Grand Valley competitive and uh, differentiates it well into the future. She's energizing, and as I was doing my research for uh, introducing her today, if you follow Grand Valley in any way on the uh, online and social media or read Grand Valley magazine, she's pretty much everywhere. <laughs> and she's interacting with staff members, uh, professors, students, community members, and what I found uh, really unique is it's hard to miss. She's, she has a big smile, and she's consistently smiling in all the pictures, and I think that, to me, says a lot about the leadership style that she's going to bring to this university. So uh, I asked a friend who was involved in the, um, in the selection process and has gotten to know the president over the last couple of months. I said, would you give... Uh, uh, the president two thumbs up and I trust that friend very much and trust her judgment and uh, the response was a resounding all ten fingers up and I thought that was a that was a really strong endorsement so I will ask you all to put all ten fingers together and welcome President Mantella. Now I have to keep smiling through the whole <laughs> presentation. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely introduction. I, I, I really appreciate it. And let me um, introduce two other women who are leading the university. Our provost, Maria Cimitelli. Would Maria, would you, would you please stand? And our dean of the Seidman School of Business, Diana Lawson. When, when I say that we need to do this together, I mean every single person in this room, and it'll take, uh, take uh, the full leadership and energy of the university and the community, which has been its history, so that's very exciting. Let me first uh, begin by thanking Peter and Joan Secchia for um, not only this breakfast, but the warm welcome. You were one of the first people to reach out to me uh, with some lovely flowers. Uh, to lend me a supportive hand. I thought that um, last night was a little over the top, though, under a tent in the middle of a tornado warning, having dinner. Um, but it was really a ball, and I got to sit next to these two incredible people. So thank you for doing this and the many things you've done for our community. So. Let me just start with, you know, why am I always smiling? I have the best position in higher education, bar none. I mean, this university has a history, um, not only of leadership, which you, you mentioned in your introduction, and I follow some incredible um, men who led this institution over decades, and it, you don't see many institutions that their growth is all up and to the right. And uh, that clearly has been the case here, whether you're talking about the growth in number of learners, whether you're talking about the growth in programs and relevant programs, whether you're um, talking about the financial health of the institution. The only thing not up and to the right is our state support, because it hasn't kept up with our growth. But, um, but largely, everything about Grand Valley is healthy when you look at a, on a balance sheet. When you meet the people of Grand Valley State University in West Michigan, you understand more deeply why it is as healthy as it is. And um, I spent the last decade in higher education working in the innovation space. And I like to think of my career as a little bit of a 360 degree walk around higher education because I've worked on literally every side of what would be the senior um, senior roles in higher education and then ended the last decade in academic innovation. So um, one of the things I've come to learn through that journey is the um, what it requires to make change and what it requires to keep a community together in making that change so that you're not activating you know the change agents with you, the seven or eight or 10 or 20 or 50, 100 early adopters, but you're activating a full community, the 2,000 faculty members, the 25,000 students, the alumni, uh, everyone, the community leaders in that, is that it requires the kind of um, 
commitment and energy and articulation of areas of focus and finding our essence, you know, what is, what do we want to hold on to? And again, in my introduction, you, you set me up perfectly because it's what don't we want to lose about Grand Valley State University as we face the change, the incredible student experience, the focus on value uh, in the education, the deep commitment with our community. Those are things we don't want to lose. So we've got to be able to anchor our essence we got to understand why we're changing, and then we've got to understand how. And the walk around in higher education that I did, I think, helped me to get into a place where not only you um, can articulate a vision, but you understand the layers of change to enable that vision. And so um, I'm really proud, I'm really excited to be the president of Grand Valley State University, and I really feel that this is an institution with that sort of entrepreneurial spirit from its origin and has built that capacity because it's changed multiple times through its lifetime, and all that change has been to a positive end. So that creates a real agility. So let me talk about the... the um, the title of this conversation today is The Future of Education, and I wanted to talk about a, a few things that I think are a part of our future in education. And I want to talk about, you know, sort of four different dimensions of change that I think are in front of us. The first is productivity in work and life. And when you think about the pace of change, the introduction of technology, artificial intelligence, um, the access to information, the number of jobs that are going to be emerging over the next several decades, and the number of jobs that are going to be fundamentally changing, and the number of jobs that are going to be eliminated, it's going to be an unprecedented time of change. So when we think about education and its response to that environment, one of the first things that comes to my mind is how we're set up. We, 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 we expect students to come in at 18 years old, and at 22 years old they leave, and they're set for a lifetime of change. It's not going to work in the future that we have ahead. We need to certainly use that period of time and that we will always invest in that coming of age experience, 18 to 22. It's absolutely critical. And even more important is Grand Valley undergirds that with a liberal education that focus on what are the skills and competencies and ability that help us as learners know when we need to get something more and know what that something is. The problem we have is that higher education as a full industry is not standing by that learner when they need something. And at times, it is standing by, but it's offering their, their wares in the same way they offer it to an 18 to 22 year old. So you say, come, you know, we're gonna assess you, start at the finish, the beginning, you know, get out an X period of time, and that's the way in which we do education. So we need to think about um, education in multiple formats. What works for the 18 to 22 year olds to be immersed in the experience, they're long on time, they're short on experience, they need that kind of immersion, and what works for us, people in this room, adults who are um, needing to upskill who are seeing that technology is transforming their industries, um, who's seeing market shifts of unprecedented speed. Um, and so we have to be able to create our educational offerings in a way that are accessible and that recognize that adults are long on experience and short on time. They're the absolute reverse. So how do we do that? How do we assure that we can offer high quality? Well, there's institutions that are in this business. Some of them are online institutions. Some of them are um, offering some innovation. You know, Harvard started the MOOC movement, but they're not putting, so they're either um, 
offering it as a commodity or they're offering it as an alternative almost to publishing. You know, you can get content online, but you can't get any credential or assessment of the learning. And so there's a there's an opportunity and there's you know, it we don't stand alone at looking at this opportunity. In fact, over the last five or six years, there's been a lot of brand level institutions very much into what would be adult or continuous learning. So, but this this fundamental change isn't a change of choice. It's needing to stand by our alums to offer elements of the learning that they're gonna need over the course of their lifetime. It's a responsibility. The second uh, major shift in higher education is the shift in enrollment. The, and, and this is probably the one that gets talked about the most, right? The demographics in Michigan are changing over the next decade. There's going to be an incredible number of stu students that won't be in our classrooms simply because the birth rate is lower and the number of 18 to 22 year olds are going to be spread largely among the same number of institutions. But I can tell you on the East Coast, we saw a lot of closures over the last decade of small private institutions, a lot. My last two years there, Probably every month I got an approach from an institution around an acquisition because they knew we were opening global campuses and that I was on point for that. So a lot is happening, very, very turbulent times because of this decline. However, 75% of the higher education market today is not 18 to 22. So we're all focused on a declining market and the larger market, because of the dynamics that I talked about, are being left to only segments of higher education and less quality options, in my mind. So um, that's another trend that um, could, we could talk about for the whole lecture, what's happening it, with credential requirements. Many of the knowledge economy jobs are still requiring masters. So the opportunity to think about the, uh, the delivery that I've talked about for post-baccalaureate education is very high as well. So there's a number of opportunities in that space, challenges and opportunities in that space. And what's interesting is they can be reinforcing. So that if you have a high quality 18 to 22 year old experience, and those students are very happy with a degree and experience, they're gonna be the ones that know you and come back to you over their lifetime. So it's not an either or choice. A lot of times in higher ed we talk about, are you a liberal education institution? Are you a professional studies edu education institution? Are you a residential institution or are you an online institution? We create these forced dichotomies when there are opportunities to do both and that one piece of work, if thoughtfully done, can serve all those audiences. The third is um, inclusivity in higher education. And if you look at Michigan and the opportunities, and they're at all levels, I'm not talking about higher education as you know, PhD, master's, baccalaureate, all levels of education, we know that social mobility is fueled by education. And we know that um, there are more people to be served. And we know we have challenges in price, financial aid, loan levels, the way in which we structure our admissions programs. If you hadn't followed the interesting, high-profile, star-studded you know, star admissions debacle, you know, that really tells it all. We have based our institutions on feeling better if we exclude people, right? That's an admit rate. Our admit rate, you know, I came from Northeastern University. We went from admitting 70% of our students over the 20 years I was there to admitting 20% because the demand became so high. Um, but we stand with pride on the 20% when in fact our populace needs education. 
And we need to find ways to scaffold and ladder and support students so they're ready for the education. And we need to understand that not everybody relates to learning the way we deliver it in the same way. Some relate to hands-on and experience. And we are competitors, but if we don't cooperate in trying to move um, more of our citizens through education, then our competition is creating a disservice, and that's not meeting our public mission. And so um, I think the way in which we, Grand Valley State University, stands at the forefront is to be doing the best possible work, leading the thought leadership, and opening ourselves up so others can participate. And that's the way we get leadership and demand and interest, and as you said in your comments, that we get visibility. Because I don't want another person to have my experience. So my experience, I had been in Michigan early in my career, and um, I knew of Grand Valley State University, and I've said this a couple times, I, I knew the nice little place that it was in the 80s. And um, I said, oh, well, when the search firm called me, um, that's a, I, I wonder what's happened at Grand Valley. And I was blown away by what I found when I started to discover, as I said. But when I told my colleagues, you know, that I was going to Grand Valley State University, unless they had a Midwest anchor, they said, where? And I don't want that to happen anymore. I want this time ahead together for us to be able to elevate what we're doing, not just for our own enlightened self-interest, which is, of course, there, um, but also because the model of education, the quality here, and I can tell you, I've lived in education. I've been at many institutions. I've opened up campuses and looked at the competitors in six different regions and two, three countries. And I can tell you, what we're doing here for the price we're doing it is amazing. And our nation needs to learn from the way in which we can make education accessible. Is it enough? I would love to be in a position to say, we don't do loans at Grand Valley State. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So if there's any philanthropists in the room <laughs> that would like to help me with that. Where's Karen? Did I do OK? OK. Um, no, seriously, quite seriously, we need to do more because, you know, for some people, the barrier is $5,000. For some people, the barrier is $500. So we need to do more because we want the brightest students, the students who are going to make an impact in their communities to be a part of our community. But we have something that the nation should see. So we owe it to ourselves and to the state. Uh, and you'll find me to be a competitive person. So you put enlightened self-interest, competition, and the fact that I truly believe that it's in the national interest uh, together. And we're going to really run hard at trying to, to um, cut through the, the morass and really have people see the good work that's doing here and model that. So inclusivity, and that includes digitization of education, includes access, supports. The fourth is what I would say is we've got to get out of our supply chain mentality. And since I'm in the Seidman School of Business, I know you all know what that is. Um, and we have to start thinking of education as an ecosystem. And one of the things that um, it, 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 we can't just start somebody at the end and they go you know, to the, to the other end. And I, I reference that in thinking about the adult market. But it's also in the connection points that we have. Um, one of the things that I feel strongly about is, is that K through 12 has innovation going on. But they're so isolated in its structure that they can't elevate it and they don't know how to scale it. And so higher education could play a role there. And again, that role is one of help and support to the citizens, but it's also one of increasing that pipeline through to higher education. So um, I mean it in a lot of different ways, the connection to industry, the connection to um, K through 12. It's an ecosystem. People should be able to go in and out of it and not have to come through it as a supply chain. So those are the dynamics I wanted to talk about. And I want to talk about um, 
just five elements, like sort of what did I learn in working in this space and what do I bring in terms of some of my thinking around how you approach these dynamics of change and the opportunity we sit on with this wonderful, extraordinary institution. The first dynamic is we have to look outside in. And I think in every faculty meeting I talk to, I encourage people to look outside in. Let's not talk about what we have and what we want to push out next because we have the opportunity to do that. Let's look at what the market needs and how it relates to the way in which we have opportunity to serve that market and what does that mean. The second is, I like to call it work at the intersections. I wrote an article just before I came here for World News, uh, University World News, which is an international paper in higher education. And um, I talked about really three things under the um, sort of working at the intersection, creating value, value extending value, and alleviating burdens. Um, and so I think there's opportunity if we don't put the sight line too far. So we need to know what the vision is. I'm talking about the change. But you know when you're approaching an intersection, you can see the cars to your right and your left and you know what to do. You see them approaching. We've got to think about higher education that way because this, this, the environment is so dynamic that if we try to be futurists, um, we're going to not really see the opportunities to sort of ladder to the vision. And so um, I think there is a number of ways to extend value. We can talk about it in the Q&A. But the most important way, and again, this institution is well positioned, is the intersection between work and learning. It's well positioned because there's all this relation. Look at this room. You know, It's the intersection of work and learning. Where are our talent gaps in West Michigan? What do we need? How do we serve the large enterprises? What are you doing in your L&D? How can we create a faster throughput for our cybersecurity students who are needed in every talent gap is talking about information, cybersecurity, computer science, project management. I could go through them all. And so um, working at the intersection of work and learning is important. I'm going to push for more experiences, more co-ops, more internships. All of the things that help create agile learners because you know what? It's not on the syllabus. They go into your companies and the nonprofits and they have to be um, responsive and apply that knowledge to what's happening in real time. So um, I think there's a huge in, there's a huge opportunity in this disruption from people who are um, comfortable with change, have a community that supports it, have a faculty that think agilely, have students that want to look with you, have community members, and that's who we are. And so I think this disruption is the opportunity for the other 75%, the enterprises, the adults, and to keep performing at the highest value. That means everybody that comes in graduates, that means our price point is good, so their return on investment, the time to degree is good. So keep performing on our core business and keep, keep innovating in the space where the larger market is. So um, I would like to, I use this phrase at um, my election as president in January, and that is that I think Grand Valley can be a breakout university. The nation needs breakout public universities. Michigan needs it. And I hope you'll all join me in reaching higher together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, not sh I'm not sure how the questions are going to be handled. Who's going to handle? Is there a floor mic? No? OK, no, there's no floor mic. So if you could uh, just raise your hand, I'll handle the questions. I probably won't know your name, so I'll just point at you and then step up and tell me who you are. That would be great. So who wants to get us started? OK, please, sir. Mm 
-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of things you said. Just to correct, I said uh, debt-free education. I didn't say free education because that's a diff <laughs> that's a different discussion. But um, to your point, I think that. Um, there are a lot of ways in which we uh, can think about um, not making debt the only vehicle, cash and debt, right? Um, and I think the income share agreements have great potential. And I have um, a person who's hungry, because I did that at Northeastern, to uh, come to Grand Valley. I think he emails me every week and says, you could be our next pilot. Um, and so I do think there is an opportunity. Uh, there's some unknowns in that space in terms of how it's going to work, so I would want to be careful where we began and have students not, in some ways, doing the same thing, giving up too large a share of their unknown revenue over unknown periods of time. Um, but I think there is some excellent places to pilot that, and I agree with you. Other questions? Yes. At Northeastern, you partnered with IBM um, on pioneering mm -hmm. uh, the, I think, a future facility in terms of badging micro credentialing. Is that something that you could see um, continuing here at Grand Valley? I do, and I think we can take it even further. Um, so. For those of you who are new to the language, you know, badging and micro-credentialing is that um, certification of learning that comes in a smaller chunk than a degree, okay? And you get a badge or, or a certificate. I th and, and just to talk a moment about the IBM relationship is, is the recognition that we're not the only ones doing um, really interesting work in learning. And IBM was doing some extraordinary work at a high quality level. So we, not, we articulated their badge, uh, certified it, you know, assessed the learning, and rolled it into our credential um, as a starting point. And I don't know the numbers at the, off the top of my head, but I know their design thinking numbers were astronomical. Their project ma management numbers were, were huge. And um, that gave um, a, a credibility to the learning that was happening. Um, and it gave an opportunity for those individuals to continue on to the degree with a bit of a jump start, of which a proportion did. And um, that was a very interesting model. And I think the ways in which that thinking can be extended are a couple of ways. One is the translation of experience. So we did it from a badge, you know, um, which is our classic learning modality, right? You're doing it online or you're doing it kind of in a classroom format and you're trying to take something on new. But you can also do it in terms of the kind of the experience people have gained through their life and certifying and understanding what that translates to in academic terms to give that jump start. And that's sort of called prior learning. Um, and you can do th those things in parallel. I like to think about it as stacking so that people, we as adults, if you asked me if I was in the same place in understanding philosophy as the provost who has her PhD in philosophy, um, the answer would be no. We both have PhDs, but m our capability in that discipline is entirely different and vice versa in the business affairs of higher education. And so it requires personalization, examination of experience, understanding what along that journey like the IBM badge, and then stacking those things to the degree um, in order to serve an adult or, or a working professional audience. I would just mention one other piece of work that I thought was particularly interesting that um, we took on when I was there, and that was um, with GE in their uh, aviation uh, areas, their aviation factories. And because of the adva advanced manufacturing, digital manufacturing um, movement, the and the retiring workforce, they had absolutely sort of no model that w could address the talent gap they were, were having. Um, and so we brought uh, a blend of online and work. It, it isn't like 
people need to leave their work in order to come to our classroom, and we're going to do it at convenient times for adults. But we brought the work onto the factory floor and articulated what they were doing into learning. And then we used the retiring workforce as mentors, trained mentors, because they had so much that was going to walk out the door, you know, hundreds of years of experience. And then we took that and replicated it on a community college campus. Remember what I said, we don't always have to do it all. They had the absolute right physical facilities for that kind of work. And then we translated our degree on top of theirs. Really interesting work. So those are a couple of examples to give you a flavor of what I say is at the intersection of work and learning. I don't have a watch, so anyone that wants to cut me off when I know this crowd needs to leave at 9, let me know. Have I been set up, do you think? <laughs> no, it's, a, it's an excellent point. And I will say that the model I came out of, for a lot of reasons, again, which I won't go into, but um, set up a second institution. So if you think of Grand Valley State University, and then you think of sort of the child of Grand Valley, uh, an accelerator, an incubator for educational change, that's the way the model worked. And there was greater tolerance for failure in the incubator model. And in fact, we'd start a lot of things in either non-credit or boot camps until they proved their market position. So very different than have an educational concept called a degree, hired faculty, many of which are tenure, tenure track, launch it and expect for it to work, right? It's sort of like fire ready aim, you know, is our model. And so we tried to create a bit of a different model. So we're going to have to think through. I think the beauty of Grand Valley is the faculty are in the game here fully. And they're, they've got that sort of muscle uh, memory around uh, entrepreneurial work. And so, um, we're but we're going to have to make space for, for experimentation, which means we're going to have to be you know this space. I'm talking to the expert. This is kind of like, she could grade me and tell me if I got an A or a B. Um, but we're going to have to set really strong, clear success metrics on our experiments. We're going to have to have lengths of time. We're going to have to figure out how we start things without um, in, in, investing in such a way that we've structured our costs before we know our revenue. All of those things have to be thought into how we make room for experimentation. Yes? I'm not sure I can answer that specific question because I haven't had an opportunity to really experience what we're doing there to know a great deal about it. But I'd say conceptually, the answer is yes. So conceptually, you're saying we've got a growing field. We've got needs at all sorts of levels. So whether you know we do it specifically or, we, again, we sort of stack from the high school to the community college into the field so that you're getting talent at all levels. Um, and we participate at the level that we feel comfortable. It doesn't replicate others who, in fact, could do it as well or better or for a lower price point. So conceptually, the answer is yes, but unless uh, Dean Lawson or the provost want to answer more specifically, I can't. Okay. Hi, my name is Dan Kelsey. I teach supply chain management here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's okay. Sure. So um, 
since you teach it, you probably also know that the first part of doing that is sort of shifting the culture and the way you think and the way you welcome diversity of thought to the table because it's not I run my area and therefore you may have good ideas but you're not in my area because I run my area. And so um, I think if you asked Dean Lawson or any of the vice presidents, there's a number here, from day one, we have established sort of rules of engagement for ourselves that those who are closest and furthest from the work have value to add. And kind of ways in which we work as a senior team where we're discussing some of those areas kind of at the highest level. The second thing that I've done is to create a broader cabinet structure so that we have two deans serving on them. Dean Lawson happens to be one. The cabinet will kick off at the end of September. Our two faculty governance leaders sit on that, a broader array of administrators, so we can get information to a broader set, get people out of their silo thinking if there is such here. Um, and that's important. The third is what I call acceleration teams. So how do you get just a group of good thinkers around a problem set in which um, will enable you to sort of break through some of those issues and not, you know, if, if, if a particular concept, you know, moves from beginning to end, uh, in, through a, a collegial governance process, and I'm aware, you know, we have faculty members in the room, it would still move through that process. But a lot of times we're enabled, it's at the 30, you know, 30 yard line, and we're getting it to the 50 yard line through an acceleration team, or it's at the starting gate and we're getting it to the 30, or et cetera. So those acceleration teams, I've picked three areas. I picked K through 12, the intersection with K 12, because that's the front end of the supply chain. And then I picked a challenge that we're having in the middle, which is um, where we have more nursing students than we could possibly want, or ha well, not want, but we could possibly serve. And then we have more need in our community. And in the middle, we have this challenge of the way we think about um, uh, disciplines, scope of care, clinicals, all of these things that are structural in nature. So that's sort of a, a middle. And then we took uh, computer science for the professional audience at the third. And so all of that is to break down silos. And I think those that participated in that, um, from the feedback I've got, and I say Paul over there. I don't know, if Paul, if you want to stand and uh, talk about it. But yeah, let me not say, what do you think participating in that was like? Not to put you on the spot, Paul. Thanks. The other thing that we do is we put money and politics aside at the beginning of the discussion. Because they derail you right off the, we can't possibly do that, we don't have the resources. We do for the, the um, CFO that's in the room in the back. We do layer it back in later. Um, or uh, for Matt McLogan, we do layer it back in later. But it is important to allow yourself to think free of those constraints and then layer it, layer it back in and see, okay, what, what, when we apply reality, what, how does it change it? But you actually are fundamentally in a different place. Yes. Yeah, you spoke earlier about this forced segmentation of universities between residential versus online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I see um, a opportunity for us, as I say, to not sort of accept the dichotomy and to, to be in all those spaces. And um, so, and I think, and I'm gonna use an illustrative example because I think it will be helpful. In, um, in online development, there is work that Dean Lawson is doing that is extending it to a, a, the business uh, portfolio to a enterprise audience or an adult audience. However, when I talk to our undergraduate advisors, they want a bigger piece of Dean Lawson and Seidman School of Business in the very same work. 
So new models to introduce some more digital um, gives an opportunity for the places which we have constraints to open them up a little bit more to our current audience. We also have, by the way, a student population that's many of them are balancing part-time jobs. And so um, talking with the student government, and I see them in the room as well, you know, they would like to see some opportunity not to change the nature of their residential experience for some digital and online to be able to find that course that's you know in sequence perhaps that's in a different direction than their part-time job and do that at a level of quality so i think we want to be in all of those spaces we're going to anchor in our reg residential experience gvsu plus be in some professional education digital education enterprise education Yes. You've gotten at this a little bit, but I just wondered as a newcomer or, or somebody coming back to West Michigan, what are some things that you've observed around Grand Valley and you wonder, why do we do it this way? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't we win the national championship the last four years in football? <laughs> no. Um, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. I mean, I think the first thing I would identify, and this is a challenging one, and the provost may hit me on the side of the head, but, um, but it is true that we've got to, institutions evolve, we've got to recognize the complexity of the current Grand Valley State University. And when you asked me that question, I introduced more complexity, right? So when I say it's going to take all of us, then structurally where the authority and accountability lies has to rebalance a bit. So it's a, we're very, very centrally um, managed and it's efficiency driven. And I'm not suggesting that we won't have a very clear central agenda and that we'll have a diminished role for that work. But if we have talent in our deans, then they need to be contributing not only to the growth of the school, but all of the areas we've discussed around there. Diana Lawson needs to be accountable for all of the areas we've talked about. <laughs> See how I shifted that so effectively? So we have some rebalancing to do with where the authority and accountability lies. We've got some articulation to do of what those things that we're all driving at and what are the measures that sort of undergird them. Um, but that's the thing is that we've got a lot of, um, uh, uh, we, we've, we've grown by evolution. So it's kind of time to step back and say, you know, what, what, do we, what do we need now in terms of the structure that we have? And I see, I don't see that as, you know, totally, um, a, a mega shift, but there are going to be places where I think structure will need to be challenged, and I think where we're going to um, move authority, and we're going to hold. When in doing that, you know, you don't just get the authority; you get the accountability that comes with it. So. I'd like to ask the last question. We are the time. I'm the time. I, I I know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. So in the audience. Great. So uh, a couple things. Thank you uh, for that. Yeah, thank you for that question. The first, for those of you in a position to um, where you're leading uh, a corporate enterprise or a nonprofit with some serious talent gaps and issues, then let us be your enterprise partner for co-creation. Now, I've just acknowledged to you when I say that that we have not, we don't have, we have great corporate support, but we haven't disaggregated our curriculum in such a way that people come, we come right to mind as the person that's gonna come in and solve your talent gap. 
So I need a couple of enterprises that want to co-create with us because who are going to be tolerant of the fact that the community is going to be learning to work in this space. So um, I'm here afterwards if anybody wants to grab me for that. Second, I told you we love high impact learning. And I think that um, those of you who are in a position to offer internships, co-ops, those kinds of experience. If they can be paid, you're helping us with offsetting our students' costs. That's even more important. I think that's the second um, element that I would say. For those of you that are entrepreneurs, 40% of the new jobs are going to come out of the work that you're doing, right? And that journey of being an entrepreneur, um, we need to, and again, this is not, we have not had our first conversation yet. But I, you know, I think that the sort of availability of entrepreneurial skills and competencies and experience and practice has to be broad, not in the Seedman School of Business as a, the only place that one can access it. So I think that for the entrepreneurs in here, put your hands up that you're ready to take on work. Boy, it's wonderful to have a bunch of students working on your project and your issues, too. And the last thing is your philanthropic support. So there are four calls to action for you. Thank you. Thank you.